good morning everyone and congratulations rohit for putting together a very nice meeting so as a first thing i'll talk about uh, epicardial mapping and ablation and when you should do it how you should do it and why you should do it and i also spend some time explaining uh, what all can be done in future from this devices so the technique to perform epicardial mapping in electrophysiology has been going on for many years if you, you all of us have done pericardiosynthesis and uh, plural uh, uh, tap to uh, assess the characteristics of fluid but over a period of time there was one other way by which you can access the heart and that was through the epicardial space now uh, this was first reported in brazil because they have lot of chagas disease and that can affect the epicardial surface of the heart more than the endocardial surface because of that this technique was pi pioneered by eduardo sosa and now it is done in practically lot of labs all over the world in before we look into this um, space let's review some of the anatomy so this is the cut section of the heart where you have opened the parietal and visceral pericardium you see all this fat so the first thing you are going to see when you open up and do a sternotomy is the right ventricle and the right ventricular outflow tract you will see lot of this fat uh, uh, which is normally seen this fat distribution is also unique that it is only around the major arteries and major ganglions of the heart so that they the and the whole idea is to protect it over a period of time now when you look at specifically a, a cut section you will see that you have a fibrous layer then a parietal per pericardium and then a visceral pericardium uh, and the whole idea about getting into the epicardial space is to get into this small space the way i like to describe it just imagine you are wearing two gloves like two 7 or 7 and a half number gloves and you have to take a small needle so that you can enter in between those two gloves without poking yourself so that's how you have to uh, get into that uh, space to do it now when you remove the heart you would see all these pericardial reflections are much more around the great arteries and behind the left atrium so that is as you are aware called as oblique sinus and transverse sinus and those areas can also be used at times for an access to do some of these procedures now again in standard teaching has been that when you do pericardiosynthesis you have to target and push the needle across the left tip of the shoulder but when you do these epicardial acts but though that's mostly described in patients who have a large pericardial effusion and those of you who have done pericardiosynthesis you would see you can throw it like a dart from any place in the room and you will still hit it and take some fluid off but getting into a dry pericardial space is little bit tricky and the reason for that is that you may angle your needle typically going towards the left shoulder but then you will you may go through the diaphragm you may go through the left lobe of liver and you may go through the left lung so the idea is to really get into this space which is just off the a uh, sternum and try to get your needle uh, just uh, below below this and then hopefully you can reach it so it should, it should not be directed towards the left shoulder but it should be, it should go below the sternum so that you can hit into this uh, sp uh, hit into this space and then do it again when you lift up a pericardial fold or recess it's very very thin so ideally when you do it it's better to do it with a micropuncture type of needle this is how we do it so you get the needle below the sternal notch the needle is going up like that you will feel like a pop the same pop you feel while doing a lumbar puncture you lift up the fold so you know you are inside you can inject some contrast and you saw that contrast getting layered on the walls of the heart and then you can advance this sorry and then you can uh, advance the wire to see if you can uh, get around it so again i'm showing you this this is the wire this is the contrast and then you will advance the wire it's important this this was a layering of the contrast it's important to look at this in multiple views so that you are aware that the whole wire is getting looped across the heart and touching the cardiac silhouette because otherwise you can push the wire inside the left or right ventricle and that can be dangerous at times so so now who needs really epicardial ablation and who really needs epicardial access so you can use epicardial or pericardial access to do epicardial mapping and ablation for ventricular tachycardia atrial arrhythmias and soon you will start hearing about newer devices which you could use to uh, uh, do appendage based uh, ligation so epicardial ablation can be done if there is thrombus in the left ventricle you cannot get into the left ventricle if there is mechanical prosthetic aortic valve or mitral valve or you have specific pathologies which can be seen on ecg such as uh, such as this so this is a patient who was in bigeminy 
and you can see this EKG now to a medicine or a cardiology eye you may just call it uh, by Gemini type rhythm and then you know uh, then try medically but if the medicines fail or if the patient is very symptomatic or they have PVC mediated cardiomyopathy then some ECG knowledge which is a bit step higher will help you to figure out whether it is endocardial or epicardial. A common way to look at that is for example lead 1. If the lead 1 activation is from the endocardial surface it goes epicardially and it goes inside the heart that's the reason why you have a normal looking QRS. However, if the epicardial is the source of this uh, PVC or rhythm, then it is going through the endocardium, mid myocardium slowly and then it comes out to the rest of the heart and that's the reason why you get something called as a pseudo delta wave or a, uh, or a pseudo Q wave type appearance. So if you have slow transmural activation, that would mean that there is a slow onset of QRS and that would suggest that the, uh, the, uh, the exit is epicardial. Same thing can be done especially in settings of inferior wall MI or anterior wall MI. If you have a transmural infarct, the ventricular tachycardia typically would have Q wave because there is no endocardial activation and you will have a QS pattern coming from uh, that uh, place from the heart. So in this EKG when I showed you, you would see there is this slurring in the downslope of QRS, a little bit of slurring in the upslope of, uh, up of the QRS that may help you to figure out whether it is epicardium or uh, endocardium. <coughs> there are a lot of ECG criteria to figure it out and some of them are specific, some of them are non-specific and like any criteria which you may have read in, uh, in, in any uh, subject you read, they have a lot of uh, limitations. But in ECG criteria, it only explains the exit side. And the reason for that is because your V1 to V6 are all unipolar leads and that's the reason why you will only see the exit sides. Some pathologies specifically such as arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, complete transmural infarct, dilated cardiomyopathy are unique that they have lot of epicardial substrate compared to endocardial substrate. So in those situations if your endocardial ablation or your endocardial approach has not worked then epicardial, uh, substrate, epicardial substrate can be done. So this is just looking at our own experience. Most of the times we did epicardial access was, was for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, subsequently ischemic cardiomyopathy and then the rest of the other things. Uh, at times whenever we had offered epicardial ablation, 80% of them have failed prior endocardial ablation with us or somewhere else and about 4% of them had prior epicardial ablation. So as a first step again because it has some risks involved, we should avoid doing epicardial but if the patient continues to suffer or is still having device shocks or VTs then epicardial access can be, uh, can be considered. Even if you do access and if you map, that is still very helpful because then at least you know that that is, the, that is not the right place to go and you can, look at else, uh, you can look elsewhere to figure out where your source of VT can be uh, coming from. Now some of the reasons why even if we have epicardial access and we don't ablate is that A, the map what we make is not very helpful. Sometimes you will have coronary arteries, phrenic nerve which is going to prevent you from uh, ablation. And if patients have had prior sternotomy or prior uh, ablations or surgeries, there is going to be a lot of pericardial adhesions which is going to prevent you from moving your uh, catheters uh, safely. Now we are mostly, most of the times you are able to get uh, good epicardial access. So it's not that difficult to do it once you start doing it a lot of them. And typically you can go either anterior or inferior to get uh, into the space. Now the good thing about whichever way you go, as, as soon as you enter the epicardial space, it's like a free way because there is no real obstructions because, and it's a simple straight empty space and you can move your catheters wherever and however you want. Now people have shown that in ischemic and both non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, epicardial and endocardial ablation both is going to be better compared with endocardial ablation only. So that's why it is again something important to do and if you're really able to find the substrate and ablate it successfully, then you mean patient can be free of medicines and it's going to have a prolonged, uh, prolonged life over a period of time. Now it has some complications and the complications number one is going to be pericarditis. All of them are going to have pericarditis. All of them will be on colchicine, indomethacine and anti-inflammatory medications. So next day post ablation when you see this EKG, it is not really acute MI but it is all pericarditis related pain. So when we do it, we tell the patient that you may have pericarditis pain for at least four to six weeks so that they are also prepared to go through, um, go through this. 
Some patients can even develop constrictive pericarditis and have gone pericardial stripping, but that is something uh, important to know. These, this is actually from one of my recent patients. Some patients may also develop delayed effusion and tamponade. And if you can see here, this is all layered thrombus and much more organized. And patients can develop effusion even like post-op day 14 from a procedure so that uh, <coughs> that could be because of bleeding of some of the smaller epicardial vessels uh, which are uh, there. You can have abdominal injury. Typically, patients who have hernia or they have uh, epigastric hernia or patients who have uh, Chagas disease where they can have giant megacolon, you can injure the abdominal organs. Liver injury is also very common uh, when, when, it can, uh, when it can occur. Other complications would be pneumothorax. You can damage or ablate the coronary arteries and uh, phrenic. Now, once you get into the space, how do you know what to, uh, how do you know what to ablate? So there is a lot of fat around and fat doesn't conduct electricity. So it's tough to know how will you identify some of these substrate. Now this is an example where this is from arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia. The, uni the endocardial voltage is completely normal and epicardial is completely normal. So then it becomes really hard to know how you are going to figure out where the substrate is, especially if it's a very focal cardiomyopathy. The way to do that is that when you put your catheter in the heart, you'll have normal looking electrogram. If there is some scar, you are going to have fractionation and delayed potentials. And if you have fat, it's going to look much more skewed and far field because fat is not going to conduct electricity. So this electrode is really picking up electricity from this part of the, this part of the heart. As you ablate, you will create a map. So this all red area is all the uh, low voltage area, whatever we have seen. This is again an LED distribution, so all the fat in the LED distribution. So you should know that where to ablate and uh, where not to uh, where not to ablate. I'll skip this uh, case and I'll talk to you in last three minutes and 24 seconds on some of the innovations what you will hear over a period of time in epicardial space. Because now that you know you can get into the epicardial space, that can be used for a lot of things for electrophysiology and even for some non-electrophysiological needs and over a period of time you will see more of these devices. Number one is pericardial uh, modification. Now if, when somebody has restrictive cardiomyopathy or severe diastolic dysfunction, the ventricle is going to be extremely stiff. Now you can actually go into that, vent you can go into the pericardial space and take some of that pericardial out, pericardium out. The reason for that is that the pericardium acts as a constraint for the restrictive cardiomyopathy or a stiff left ventricle and you can release that kind of pressure what they have. Now you must have all had experience, you could use as much diuretics as you want, as much antihypertensive medicines as you want, but nothing really works. But this is some of the initial work we have done which has shown that if you strip off some of the pericardial pericardium, you may release the constraint and they may do symptomatically, uh, symptomatically better. The second thing what I wanted to show you is that at times when we ablate inside the ventricle, uh, ablate inside the epicardial space, it's tough to deliver e uh, energy because there is no flow or there is no water in that area. So you can potentially put new catheters. So this is an example of that where you can put in a catheter in the space that will itself irrigate the sp uh, epicardial space and then you can do an ablation. So when you are doing this or even when you see in your day-to-day -day practice when patients have pericardial tamponade, and if they go into VF, you will not be able to get them out of VF even if you shock them 10 times. The reason for that is that fluid or blood, whatever is there, acts as an acts as a in, uh, resistance and the impedance in the system is going to be much higher. So you have to drain all that uh, fluid off before you shock. But this technique will help to irrigate the epicardial space with saline so that the impedance is going to be lower and then you can ablate it more effectively. Other uh, places is CRT. Sometimes you can put in a CRT lead, but it's not pacing. There are certain anatomical variations. And you know you may refer the patient for surgery for CRT. There can be a lot of phrenic stimulation. However, with a newer device, what we are developing, it's like a big ring you can put on the left ventricle. And you can pace from any of these electrodes in any morphology as you want. So you are going to have much more uh, electrodes from which you are going to pace. Similarly, with ICDs, patients have pain when they get shot, but you can have painless defibrillation because the epicardial surface doesn't have many nerves, and that can also be used for, uh, uh, for defibrillation. 
And lastly, this is a new device which we just came up with called atrial appendage ligation. And what we do in that is that we put this snare from the epicardial surface which grabs the left atrial appendage and pulls it out and then we put a suture across it and then we snare it. The advantage of this is that patients absolutely don't need any anticoagulation because you may have seen with watchmen and all the devices that patients still need anticoagulation but here you won't be needing any anticoagulation and these are some of the pictures for that. So in summary, we went over some of the anatomy. Epicardial access is little difficult to do, but it's like driving a car, especially in Delhi. You know, with the traffic and everything else, you know, as you get more used to it, you will, will, you will be able to get into that epicardial space. Some of the indications for epicardial ablations we went over, most of the times it's for ventricular tachycardia. So you should be aware of some of the EKG characteristics. So even if you have a patient and the EKG looks completely epicardial exit, then you know that you need to send it to an experienced person who knows how to do it. We went over some of the outcomes and some of the pericardial innovations, you know, which you will see at some point in the next four to five years and that can be helpful. So I think I'll stop here with this and if you have any questions. Nice summarization or uh, uh, Chris presentation regarding epicardial uh, access and uh, indications and new things. How many of these things can be practiced in our country as of now? So f that's a great question Meeting. and whenever you know you'll hear any speaker coming from outside and who will show you all this fancy technology, the first thing you're going to hear is oh we can't afford it or our patients can't afford it. But really for epicardial access you need a lumbar puncture needle which anybody is going to afford it. You can go to any emergency room, they are going to have it. And you need a 035 wire which all the cath labs are going to have it. So I don't know how much 035 wire costs, but getting into the pericardial space is going to be about 100, 100, 200 rupees. So it's not that expensive to do it. Plus, if you're doing pericardiocentrisis, it's just one step extra to put in a sheath in that and then do your mapping. Because the ablation catheter is going to be the same what you are going to use for your pericardial, for your otherwise routine ablation. So it's not going to add a whole lot of cost to the procedure. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation in really so much simple and easy words to understand for everyone right. actually. So really congratulations oh, to of you. course Mayo Clinic uh, yeah. for such so many innovations right. as well. I do have some questions. Yeah. We all are aware of the role of epicardial access, especially for accessory pathways right. when they have been tried to ablate from endocardial side, otherwise VTs as well. And uh, even for the atrial fibrillation as well, uh, there is a growing role for that, in fact. And uh, 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 I remember, so we had been using a left atrial appendage occluder device, similar to the one which is called as Lariat. Lariat, yeah. I mean, way back in almost 2015. But of course, the rate of complications with that was yeah. almost a little bit higher, going up to like 25 to 30 percent. Right. But of course, there was an American surgeon who was uh, who got it USA, US FDA approved for something else, but he's using it for this. Right. Did you have any other? So I, we, we had I, we had used Lariat before, but Lariat has many steps because you have to go from the groin transeptal go and then find the magnet so that these two magnets will attract and connect it. But this device is very straightforward. It just goes in and. You know, you know you have captured it because you will get ST elevation by current of injury kind of phenomenon and you will know whether you have a full grasp. It is completely epicardial so you don't need any medicines after that so that is going to be helpful. Your first question was interesting, accessory pathway ablation, epicardial if somebody is doing it that means they have not ablated right endocardially. So you know people report that you may do epicardial ablation of accessory pathway but 99.99% all accessory pathways will be done endocardially. So if one of your patient hasn't had a good outcome, then you know, they may, may want to try it again. Now, epicardial atrial fibrillation is growing because all the ganglions for the left atrium are epicardially, which cannot be accessed endocardially. So there is some growing interest for epicardial ablations for atrial fibrillation. Uh, actually, even at Master University Medical Center as well, so we had a combined team of cardiologists and the cardiac surgeons, especially for the post-receptal access to yes. pathway up to one person, so they can be epicardial. So what had happened, I remember, uh, Dr. Mark Hamir, he's the one who was doing this. Um, so for example, they had they tried it twice, endocardially, they couldn't get it. They went into the epicardially, so you can just point it out as well, right. where you get the good signals. One ablation, gone. 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 Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. VT, I couldn't understand uh, some cases for uh, uh, epicardial access. Uh, what about AF? AF, right now we are not doing much for epicardial access for AFib because it's not proven yet and 
you know, it's much bigger production to do it. Plus, AFib outcomes is still not the best. So it's hard to justify doing a complicated when you are not going to get much out of it. But I think in next few years, you may see some more promise epicardially for doing some of these procedures. Maybe uh, it will uh, add on to the value in the sense that the, if, if the <coughs> overall evidence is proven, the success rate will be much easier than uh, the endocardial thesis. That's, that's true. But you know, atrial fibrillation is like diabetes. You know, I mean, you can't cure diabetes by giving insulin. You know, you can put 10 stents, but you're not curing coronary artery disease. So if people look at it that way, then, you know, expectations will be more realistic than like curing atrial fibrillation. I mean, if you look back in time, the only things which we have really cured is that when we are able to either take something out of the body, like appendicitis or gallbladder surgery or hysterectomy, or if you get a vaccine, but other, and accessory pathway and SVTs because it's a clear target to ablate. But beyond that, you know, anything we do in medicine, nothing can be cured. I think you have a very valid point, but we all need to remember as well that Coxsmith surgery is the one which is still considered the gold standard for AF ablation. Right. And that's what I'm going to show, especially in the hybrid approach as well. Okay. If you can mimic those lines yes. in a good way, right. even epicardially right. as well, you can get a really you, good success yeah. rate as well. But right now, our success rate is about 70-80%, so it's getting better. I think it's only going to get better. Yeah, exactly. So even the hybrid approach as well, which yeah. we have been practicing, so we do have those long-term success results right. as well. And uh, they are on par with the cox right, procedure, right. in fact. So even for persistent, uh, long-standing persistent AF as well, right. so we do have a success rate of almost 80%, 80 right. 85%. Right. That's not really too much positive as yeah, well. So that's but amazing. 80 to 85%, yeah. in fact. If you say a success rate for any procedure is 85%, that is amazing, you know, yeah. because, you know, for example, we say for cataract surgery, it is 95%. Just because after cataract, they anyways die in 10, 15 years. So, but beyond like 50 years, 100 years after cataract surgery, who knows how long the lens is going to last. So it all depends like what, how you're going to study that particular population and that subject. So.